My name's Bobby. I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me back there? Good. How you doing? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, you know, I'd like to thank Maurice for inviting me to participate in the conference. This is the first time ever I've been in Ocean City, and it's a beautiful city. I got a little red. You can tell I was on the beach today with my friend Corinne, and only for a little bit. Uh, about four years ago, I got invited to a conference in North Carolina, and I got there on Thursday. And I, you know, I, I have fair complexion, so I got sunscreen like 90 all over my body, <laughs> with the exception of my feet, because I'm walking in the water. And this is a true story. In fact, there's a couple people here who were there when it happened. I wind up getting sun poison on my feet. I was a Saturday night speaker. I wore a suit, and I was barefoot. <laughs> in fact, I flew home, and they weren't going to let me on the plane because I couldn't wear shoes. I was in grad school at the time. I went home for a week. I couldn't go to work, couldn't go to school, couldn't do nothing. So I've definitely learned my lesson, and, and I got my shoes on tonight. So <laughs> My home group is the McKean Street Miracle Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet at St. Agnes Hospital, Broad McKean Street, South Philadelphia, seven nights a week at 7 o'clock. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop by. We'd love to have you. And then for afterwards, we'll go out for cheesesteaks. You know? <laughs> Chapter 5 of the big book is real clear in what I'm supposed to do tonight. I will tell you in a general way what my life was like as an active alcoholic, what happened to me, and what my life is like today as an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was born in a very blue-collar ethnic neighborhood. Uh, I, you know, I'm one of eight. I've got seven brothers and sisters. My mother was pregnant for nine years. Like We're all one after another. And uh, there was no booze at all in my house. And I never felt a part of. Always had that feeling of never being a part of. We had no booze in my house, the reason being my father did not drink and my mother could not drink. My mother suffered from a history of mental illness and abused prescription medication, so we had no booze at all in the house. My grandparents lived around the corner from us, and that's where all the family functions were held. They had a bar in the basement, and you know, the christenings, the graduations, and things like that. And that's where I had my very first drink. I was just a kid when I had that drink. I didn't get drunk the first time I drank, but what I remember clearly, a uh, no, number of things. First of all, my first drink was Ballantyne beer. I remember that because Ballantyne used to sponsor the Phillies, and I remember going up to Connie Mack Stadium with my father, and Ballantyne had that old school board in right center field. And I was running around the basement bar, polishing off the half empties, or the half fulls, it all depends on perception. But I was polishing off the half empties, and my uncles were looking at me to say, hey, you know, I got tons of uncles too. And uh, my uncles were looking and say, hey, look at him, look at Bobby. And that's what I craved, the attention, you know. My drinking really took off in high school. Most of the kids in the neighborhood went to the local diocese in high school. But my parents sent me to a private Jesuit high school. And right away, I felt kind of different, you know, because my, you know, the, the neighborhood, the blue-collar neighborhood I grew up in, most of the kids who went to this school were from affluent families from the suburbs. And it was just me and a couple of the dirt balls in the neighborhood who went there. And these kids, as they was getting dropped off by their parents in their luxury automobiles, me and the guys in the neighborhood were inside robbing their lockers. And I knew that was wrong, you know, but you know what? We had a reputation because we walked to school, and I had a lot of nicknames, and one of those nicknames was Crazy Coil. So I would do things in my gut that knew was wrong, felt uncomfortable doing. It went against all the values and principles I had instilled in me as a kid growing up, but I did it anyway because the need for me to be accepted and liked by you outweighed anything else. So, you know, uh, these are the kind of things I did. I remember I'm at the prep the two or three weeks in September. It's football season. We had an away game, football game. We rented a bus. There was drinking, there was fighting, there was police activity, all that fun stuff. And then, uh, you know, after everything got sorted out, we were supposed to report to the disciplinarian the following Monday. We, I'm outside his office. There's about nine of us lined up outside his office, all upperclassmen except me and another kid from the neighborhood, the, two, the only two freshmen there. He came up. He made a beeline right for us. Okay, standing in front of us. They said, what's with you guys? You guys in here in two weeks, you're getting this jackpot already? I just shrugged my shoulders. She said, you know, Father, just one of them things. <laughs> it didn't take me long with the size up situations. I didn't hang out with the smart kids. I didn't hang out with the athletes because I was none of those, th those things. I hung out with the guys who were about partying and for acting up. And it, it, like I said, it didn't take me long. I was in a situation I could size up who was about what, and they're the, ten they're the guys I tend to hang out with. Now, this school's in a pretty rough area in North Philadelphia. 
In fact, when Truck introduced me as the city uh, from the city of brotherly love, that, that, that's definitely a misnomer. We don't like anyone. <laughs> Christ. We got a court at our football stadium for Eagles game. I mean, that just sums it up, right? So, but uh, however, so, so the school's in North Philly. It's on 18th Street. And um, four blocks away is the subway and uh, on Broad Street. And a, a lot of these kids, it was their first introduction to the inner city. So at the end of the day, they would take the trolley car the four blocks out to Ride Avenue to catch the subway. I was a sophomore at the prep. Three blocks away on the corner of 15th and Gerard was a bar called the Ebony Showcase Lounge. When I was a sophomore, I was a regular at the Ebony. And I went there for a couple different reasons. You know, they had dancers, they had cold beers, but again, it was the reputation because these kids would take the trolley car four blocks to catch the subway. They would scatter the neighborhood. So me and my guys in the neighborhood, we would stroll out to the, uh, Gerard Avenue and sit in the bar to show how tough we were. And I can now tell you, every time I strolled out Gerard Avenue or sat at the Ebony, I was terrified. But I didn't want anybody else to know. Again, I was like a legend in my own mind that we had to keep this reputation up, you know? And it's amazing, because you look back at it, and I'm what, 16, and I look like I'm 12, and I got my blazer on, and as you could tell that from the name of the bar, I wasn't from the neighborhood, but they served me anyway. They didn't care, it was just nuts. And uh, it went on like that. I didn't distinguish myself at the prep. I didn't do barely either. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by, and that would be the standard for the rest of my life, you know? Uh, when it came time to graduate from the prep, I really had no desire to further my education, and it kind of took my parents off because we didn't really have much growing up, and they made a lot of sacrifices. You know, I had an opportunity, uh, an appointment to Annapolis, and I kind of blew that, and you know, that's, that was kind of a problem because my dad and all of my uncles, they all went there, and it was just kind of assumed I would go. And uh, it wasn't. I didn't go, and I knew there'd be hell to catch. I couldn't stay home. Uh, you know, because I couldn't tolerate whatever flack I was going to catch, and I couldn't get my uh, job, I had no skills, and I couldn't get my apartment, I had no money. So the only other option left was enlisted in the service. So I enlisted, uh, which was really like a slap in the face. And uh, that really wasn't a bright move, because back then in the 70s, I was, you know, the military wasn't popular. No one else was going. I enlisted, everyone's people going north and avoiding it, and here I am enlisting. And that's where my drinking really took off. Uh, I never messed around with other substances up to this point, never, nothing at all. And I had a lot of good friends in my neighborhood who had gone over and got whacked on certain things, but I didn't mess around with stuff. I wound up getting sent overseas for 13 months, and that's when my drinking really took off. I was there a couple months, and several good friends of mine got killed, and I didn't know how to handle that, you know? Because we didn't talk about nothing growing up, you know? Everything stayed inside us, you know? And once you moved out of the house, you were no longer privy to the secrets of the house. I mean, that's just the way it was. If we talked, it was all surface stuff. And uh, when my friend's getting killed, I don't know how, how to handle this, but I know booze numb the pain. And that's what I did. I just drank enough to numb the pain. And the career in the, in the military was the same anywhere else. I gave the bare minimum effort required to get by. I didn't distinguish myself, but I didn't get any jackpots either. I was just one of those guys who was just skating along, hoping not to draw any attention to myself. When my tour was up, I came home. I enrolled in school. I, I went to St. Joe's and uh, I wound up taking a couple civil service exams. I need to back up. I always forget to tell this. It is an important part. Uh, the night before I left for basic training, my father took me out to dinner. My father does not drink. I've never seen him drink in my life. He ordered two beers. I couldn't drink. First of all, I was shocked that he ordered two beers because he was always after me not to drink, and here he is buying me a drink. But I couldn't drink. I, you know, he took two sips of the beer. I didn't take anything. The bottles just sat there. And he said, and you know what? I was anxious to get through dinner because I want to go back to the neighborhood because they were having a party for me. But here it was, an opportunity to drink for free. But the fact is, it was a drink with my father, and I couldn't do that. You know, and that dawned on me a few years later because I realized it was my dad's way of trying to reach out for me. And a lot of people reached out to me, and I kept people at a distance, you know? So, uh, I, I'm going to St. Joe's, and I'm not setting myself on fire there either, you know, just skating by. And uh, a couple nights before, a friend of mine called me up and said, Bobby, the Phillies are playing tomorrow, one of those businessman specials, you know, one of them weekday afternoon games. He said, you want to go? I said, sure, I'll go. Because it wasn't going to miss me in the classroom. I, like I said, I wasn't participating there. So me and him, uh, we went down, and uh, there were three other guys from the neighborhood, and they had since moved. They're playing at Vet Stadium in South Philly. And it's like a, it's at the end of the semester, so it's like May, and it's an unusually warm day. 
and the sun's beating down on us, and we're sitting up with a sun at a 700 level, drinking that cheap watered down beer, and I'm getting trashed. And it's like, like a Tuesday, like 12, 15, something like that. And I told my friends, I said, you know what? I'm gonna run down in the field and meet one of the players. <laughs> and they kind of shrugged me off because another nickname I had was Bullshit Bob. I would say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I did that. I didn't do nothing. I drank and made stories up, that's all I did. So uh, I worked my way down to the old picnic area they had there at the time, and I had jumped over the fence, and I ran out, and you know, I'm probably by in center field before anybody knows what's going on. The San Diego Padres were in town, and Dave Winfield was playing right field for the Padres. And I ran out, and I shook his hand. I said, hi, Dave, how you doing? <laughs> and, it, and he looked at me. He said, brother, he said, what are you doing out here? And from behind him, I saw the guards coming. I said, Dave, I got to go now. <laughs> so I start running towards the infield. And as I was running towards the infield, I want to slide into second base. But I knew if I would slide into the base, I'd get caught because there was guards coming from the third base side. So I turned around and I start going towards first base. And then I start walking like I'm going to give myself up to the guard. And I'm about five feet from the guard. At the last second, I dig the guy. And I ran out in the outfield. Now I'm running around like a screwball. Seems like about ten minutes, but it's probably closer to two or three. But you know, they couldn't catch me. <laughs> I just got out of service. I was in good shape. But up on the scoreboard, they put Mr. Excitement. It was, you know... <laughs> but you know what? I had nowhere to go. Here I am, I am now out of breath, I'm drunk, I'm about to get sick, like the fence is 12 feet high, like I'm stuck, so I finally stopped. I just waited in the right field, waiting for him to come catch me. And as he caught me, they was taking me off the field, I got a standing ovation from 37,000 people. <laughs> no. No. Tug McGraw was in the bullpen for the Phillies, he gave it a thumbs up, so where to go. <laughs> Now, because I made these guards look so stupid, I knew I was going to get a beating. That was okay. They could have beat on me all day long because that standing ovation from 37,000 people, that was an incredible feeling. But not only that, see, I, if I went back to the neighborhood and told that story, you know, hey, bullshit, Bob, you know, I had four witnesses from the neighborhood. I knew that when I went back to the neighborhood, I could drink for the next week off that story alone, you know. <laughs> My friends told me, you know, when, when, they rec when they knew it was me, there was a, a group sitting in front of us and they were smoking something. And uh, they turned around and said, hey, that was your friend. And, you know, they were celebrities. It was nuts. So I'm about to get beaten from the squad. All of a sudden, this Philadelphia police lieutenant, big guy, showed up. He said, what's the matter with you? He said, are you drunk? Are you high? I said, no, no, no. I'm just happy. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> he said, well, you better get your happy ass out of the stadium. So... <laughs> But not only did he save me from a beating, that's important, but he saved me from getting arrested, which is like a little bit more important. Because in civil service exams I took like six months before, one of them panned out, and six weeks later, you know, I'm in the Philadelphia Police Academy. <laughs> <laughs> they was hiring anybody back then, it didn't matter. I got hired, we had a mayor at the time, a guy by the name of Frank Rizzo. Frank was a former cop, and there was 8,500 of us, and we did whatever the hell we wanted to do. It was a gang, a gang with badges. And I'm not even old enough to drink. The drinking age in Pennsylvania was always 21. At that time, the drinking age over in Jersey was 18. And I used to go over to Jersey all the time. In fact, where I lived in Philly, I could be in Jersey quicker than other parts of Philadelphia. But, uh, you know, once I got on the job, you know, I can go wherever I wanted, you know, just badge my way in. And, uh, I spent my first 10 years in North Philadelphia, and I saw the ravages of alcoholism and drug addiction day in, day out. And at the end of my tour, I would go to, uh, to the bar with guys in the squad and drink and uh, numb the pain. And I saw some things that bothered me. I even engaged in behaviors that I wasn't comfortable with. But I couldn't tell my coworkers the way I really felt because I didn't, I didn't want to be thought less than. I wanted to be one of the boys. And like I said, I even engaged in behaviors I knew was wrong but the need for me to be accepted by my co-workers outweighed anything else. And it was ugly, you know? And uh, that story I talked about running on the field, I, I told it for a couple of different reasons. One, it's true. It, it's definitely a true story. Secondly, it's one of the few funny stories I got, you know? I wasn't a funny guy, you know? I wasn't a, a you know, I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a lover. I, I was none of that stuff. I was a lion thieving, stinking, falling down, violent drunk. And if I hung around you, you had something I wanted. I used and abused every person I came in contact with. 
Another thing, it's the only story I remember because I was also a black ale drinker. And I was a black ale drinker from the very first start. And I remember I would show up on the corner the next day and the guys would tell me these stories. Oh, Bobby, you should have seen yourself last night. You did this, you did that. And I would laugh and say, yeah, I remembered. I didn't remember nothing. I was a blackout drinker earlier and often. So, so I'm on the job. And uh, I, I'm at a family function one day and one of my uncles was there and he was, he was a supervisor on the job. And he pulled me off to the side. He said, Bobby, I'm hearing stories about you. You're gonna get yourself in the jackpot. You better take it easy one ear and out the other. I'm at work one day, my supervisor, my immediate supervisor pulled me off to the side. He said, you know what, kid? You're smart, you're gonna go places. That booze is gonna mess you up, in one ear and out the other. Several years later, when I got sober, on two separate occasions, I ran into that supervisor and my uncle in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized that at that point, they were trying to 12-step me. But talking to my uncle, I said, Jimmy, I said, how come you didn't tell me? He just smiled. He said, Bobby, I told you, you just weren't ready yet, you know, which just goes to show you that all the booze and all the everything else that went with that was necessary for me to hit my bottom because I was the last guy to figure it out. Everybody else knew, but, it, but I was the most important guy to figure it out because once I figured it out, now I know what I could do, you know. I made my first meeting in 1979, and I don't tell people I went out because I really never came in, but I'll tell you what happened. I showed up at work one day, and uh, we had uh, one of my coworkers that showed up drunk, and we had an EAP, we had a counseling unit, and part of that counseling unit had an AA group. And I showed up, it was in the morning, and the, the supervisor said, take this guy up to the unit, he's detailed there for the day. I said, okay. So I'm coming down this uh, little house that sat in a park, and I'm coming down this driveway, and there was a guy sitting on the porch, his name was Eddie M. And I pulled up and said, Eddie, I'm dropping this guy off, I'll be back at four o'clock to pick him up. Eddie looked me dead in the eye. He said, kid, do you want to come in? I said, no, I don't. I was insulted that he even asked me. <laughs> because I knew what was going on in there. That was alcoholics. And I knew what alcoholics were. There they was some poor souls I was dealing with day in, day out. And it was for you older guys. And you married guys. And you guys are the three heads and all that other stuff. <laughs> I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a beer drinker. And the only time I drank hard liquor was like on St. Patty's Day or New Year's Day or payday, but I was a beer drinker. <laughs> and there was no way you could be an alcoholic drinking beer. I got sober a few years later, and Eddie was one of the first guys I saw and as soon as I, in my first outside meeting. And as soon as I came in, he just smiled. He said, so kid, you finally came around. And again, it was just to show you that every drink and all the behaviors went with it were necessary for me to recognize that I had a problem. I was... Uh, 24 years old and I wound up shooting and killing a 15 year old kid in the line of work and it was a terrible situation that just couldn't be avoided. And uh, a lot of people offered assistance to me and I turned them down and that's the excuse I used. I crawled in the bottle for the next three years and I wound up getting sober when I was 27. And it, it was just terrible, you know. And my drinking took me to a lot of my nevers and one of those nevers is the use of other substances I wound up getting uh, promoted and transferred and I was in this situation where I thought I needed to do other substances. And uh, so I uh, start, uh, I start messing around with other substances. The use of other substances is very short for me. It only lasted 17 months, but it caused me a lot of grief and pain and that's what helped chase me in the rooms of AA. And I think out of the fifth tradition, that's really I all need to talk about that stuff. You know, drinking took me everywhere. It was Memorial Day weekend, 1988. I'm sitting in this bar in my neighborhood, the guys from my squad were having a party, and one of the guys I was with, at, after hours of drinking, decided that he needed to go home, and I forget for whatever reason. And I turned to him, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a ride home, because I didn't think that I was as drunk as he was, and he thought that was a good idea. So uh, I was driving him home, and I was driving out this street, I've always been a show-off. I was always an arrogant guy. And I, saw, and I saw this guy, this kid on a bicycle. He was about three blocks away from me. And I decided that I was gonna show off my driving skills in front of my coworker. And I decided I was gonna play chicken with this kid. And unfortunately, as we got closer, at the last second, I turned in the same direction and ran this kid over. 
as he lied bleeding on the hood of my car, I got out of my car with my nightstick. I was going to beat this kid because I thought he was mocking me for an insurance claim. The guy that I was with prevented me from doing that. I took this kid off the hood of my car and threw him off to the side of the street like a piece of trash. I pulled this crumpled bicycle from underneath my car and threw that off to the side of the street like a piece of trash. I drove back to the bar. I made a remark. I scored 10 points, and I continued on drinking. When I came to the next day, I realized I was in serious, serious trouble, but I didn't think anybody would help me because I was such a creep. Like I said, if I came in contact with you, I hurt you. So I didn't know what to do. So I got a bottle of liquor, a case of beer, and some other substances, and I checked in the hotel with the, courage, with the intention to consume all this stuff to build up the courage to end my life. And three days later, they're knocking on the hotel to kick me out. And at this point, I couldn't shoot myself because I was suspended from my job. I no longer had access to my weapon. So I walked over to the window, and I opened up the window, and I was going to jump out. And when I opened up the window, I was on the fifth floor, and I remembered I was scared of heights. <laughs> I made 23 jumps. I never overcame my fear of heights. So I went in the bathroom and I filled the bathtub up with water and I had a blow dryer and I was gonna pull the blow dryer in the tub to make it appear an accidental electrocution. But every time I would pull the blow dryer into the tub, it would come unplugged. I was about a foot and a half short on cord. So I got one foot in the tub and I'm leaning, trying to plug it in. You know, it's like a scene of a Woody Allen movie. I couldn't even kill myself, you know. And so the only other tool that I had left was my car, you know. And a few weeks before, I was uh, sitting home from work, and I was whacked, and uh, I'm reading the paper, and uh, there was an article in the paper. It said, alcohol problems, drug problems, depression, marital problems, thoughts of suicide. I was four out of five, because I was single. And I know if I was married, I would have been batting a thousand. And I took a look at the ad, and I said, maybe, and they talk about the moment of clarity or sanity, but as soon as it came, it quickly left. But something made me cut that ad out, and I stuck it in my wallet, and I continued on drinking. So here I am in this hotel room, and I got to go, and I had no tools left. The only tool that I had left was my car. So I took one last spin through the neighborhood, and I started up at the Falls Bridge, and I calmed down the East River Drive, riding towards the Art Museum. And for those who are not familiar, the East is a very winding road along the Schuylkill River. And it's a weekday. It's a Tuesday or Wednesday. It's around 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, because that's important. Because as I'm coming down the drive, I initially thought that I would end my life in an automobile accident and I would just switch lanes and go on to oncoming traffic. And I realized at that point that I don't want to do that, you know. I, I don't want to hurt anybody else. And like I said, I hurt everyone I came in contact with. And something came over me and I wasn't aware of it now. I now know it was my higher power, but then I didn't realize that. And I knew that I didn't want to hurt anybody else. So I decided I would wrap myself around a tree and I'm coming down the east, and like the, the speed limit is 35, and I'm doing 60, and I'm, and I'm crying, and I'm cooked, and I'm just out of my mind, you know? And I now know my higher power is looking out after me, because after any other conditions on that road, in that state of uh, mind, uh, I, there, there would be an accident. And I stop at the end of East River Drive, and it's Boathouse Row. And I sit behind the wheel of my car, and I cry like a baby for about 10 minutes. And I reached into my glove box, and in, there was my wallet. And in my wallet was that article that I clipped out of the Daily News four or five weeks before. And it's no longer there, but at the end of the last boathouse is one of those old glass and closed phone booths. And I went into that phone booth, and I dialed the phone number up. I had the article in front of me. The woman who answered the phone, God bless her, she, she just listened patiently because once I started, I couldn't stop. I just poured my whole heart, my story out to her. And she didn't interrupt me, she just listened patiently, and I guess when I stopped to catch my breath, she said, listen, she said, why don't you drive over to Hahnemann Hospital and somebody be waiting to talk to you. And it's like about a five minute drive. I said, okay. So I got my car, I took the drive over to Hahnemann, they was waiting for me. And they admitted me to the 10th floor of a psychiatric unit. I was there about three days, three or four days. And they got me stabilized. And from there I got transferred to the VA hospital out in 38th and Woodland, West Philadelphia. And I spent about six weeks in their flight deck. And from there, I got transferred to the VA hospital in Coatesville and spent a number of weeks in their flight deck. Then they put me in an alcohol and drug ward. When I pulled over to ask for help that day, Alcoholics Anonymous was the furthest thing from my mind. I did not believe that I had a problem with booze. I thought maybe it was my short use of other substances. If I left this stuff alone, I'd be okay. 
Maybe I got this mental illness and I inherited this from my mother. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're talking about that I got this from my job, or I got this from my, you know, the service. Maybe it's the fact that I'm a mommer. Maybe it's the fact that it's a neighborhood I live in. It's all this other stuff going on, but it can't be booze because I'm a beer drinker. They put me in an alcohol and drug ward. I'm at the VA hospital. I'm in there about 15, 20 minutes. I come into the day room. And in the day room, on the day room walls, they got the large window shades, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. I go through the steps, I zip through them. I got about six of them done. I saw the amends. I said, they're screwed. That doesn't apply to me, you know? I was just nuts, you know? I'm looking around the rooms and I see all these slogans, you know? Uh, it's just, I'm just crazy. Later that night, though, two men came up, and I would later find out that they were part of the treatment facility committee, and they came up and carried the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment that this speaker said something about his background that I didn't like, couldn't relate to, I didn't identify with, I would immediately tune him out. See, I was too busy listening to the messenger and not the message, you know? And at the end of the meeting, everyone got in a circle and said the Lord's Prayer. If this is what your people were about, then I don't want nothing to do with you. Because I hated God. And I know there's strong words, but that, that sums it up. I hated God. And there were a couple of different reasons. And one of the, one of the reasons, my mom, her, her fun, uh, was the mental illness. My mom was like a fundamentalist with the church. And she thought she could speak in tongues and was doing all types of stuff. And there was candles and pictures and many times in institutions and things like that. I'm 15 years old, I'm in my house, I'm coming home from school, I'm the only one in the house, about 10, 15 minutes, and I came across my mother, she had slit her wrist. And I remember when I found her, she looked up at me, she said, Bobby, help me. And I looked down at her, I said, good for you. And I walked out of the house, and I had got an older guy for me to go to the state store, and he got me a bottle of wine, and I stayed outside, and I drank the wine. And I came home later that night, my father had told me what had happened, and I acted surprised, I said, oh yeah, how about that? That happened when I was 15. I got sober when I was 27. That's 12 years of hating God. And it would be a couple more years before I would deal with this. So when the, everyone got in the group and said the Lord's Prayer, I would break away from the circle and would not participate. You know, and I told you, I seen these slogans up on the wall. Live and let live, keep it simple, all this other stuff. Now I'm having, like, recollections. I remember when I used to pull cars over, right? Not often because the area I worked was a high crime area. I didn't do many car stops, but some, some, sometimes I had to do it. And I would, bump, I would roll up on these cars, right? And I would see these bumper stickers. One day at a time. Live and let live. And I said, oh, Christ, I got one of these Jesus freaks. I said, I'm going to hammer them. <laughs> so I would go up to the car, and they would say, I'm going to a meeting or whatever. I said, yeah, right. And I would hammer them on tickets. I just go, up and say, here you go. You know? Now I see all these slogans. Now I wonder why the hell everyone in AA is speeding. You know, what's the rush? <laughs> so, but I was just nuts. But, uh. I, there was a wonderful nurse at the, at the, at the VA hospital, and, and, and I, I say that, I'm about to say this, and it's not to get a laugh. Uh, she had to be an Al-Anon member. She, she was just a sweetheart, and, uh, and a very intuitive, and just, a, just on the money. See, I, I was nuts, and, and I was even acting nuts, and, and I picked up on it that people thought I was nuts. And you know what? It was all sham. It was a defense mechanism to keep people at bay, and she saw right through it. And she came up to me afterwards, and she said, you know what, the only way you're staying sober, you're going to make it. You're going to need to go to AA meetings. And I need to tell you that's the best piece of advice I got, you know. The VA helped me with a lot of issues I had, but I didn't get my recovery there. I would get my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that day, when I got out of the VA hospital, I started making AA meetings, sometimes two or three a day, depending on my work schedule. And I got made meetings on a daily basis, all the time. And I would get there late, and i leave early. I don't drink coffee, so I don't make it. I don't smoke cigarettes, so I don't empty any ashtrays. I don't take your phone numbers, I don't like you. Most of you people are screwballs anyway, I don't like you. <laughs> but I made meetings, made meetings. But if I walked into a big book meeting, or set meeting, that was strictly by accident, I would have something more important to do, I'd leave it to break. God forbid a tradition meeting, rules. My line of work, we enforce them, we don't follow them, they're for the other people. I, I'm not into following the rules. But I made meetings. I was interested in war stories, and the moment that the speaker said something about his background that I didn't like, couldn't identify with, or just didn't relate to, I would immediately tune him out. I was too busy listening to the messenger, not the message, you know, looking for the differences and not the similarities. These guys are divorced. I'm not divorced. Probably because I've never been married, had something to do with that. These people have been arrested. I've never been arrested. Probably because of my job, it certainly enabled me over the years, you know. 
I, all the differences. And you know what? I was just nuts. And, it went, and the only time I got my hand up to share something, I, it was like to cross talk at somebody, like to shoot somebody down. And at the end of the meeting, they would all get in a circle and, sit, and hold their hands and say the prayer. And I wouldn't participate. I would step away from the group. And, and they, they told me to keep coming back. And I thought they were being facetious. So I said, okay, I'll keep coming back. I'll show you. I was just nuts. I was sober about nine months, and I'm sitting in this bar because they sell real good roast beef. You know, they sell good. And I'm drinking seltzer out of a rock glass. And, you know, so I'm, and these guys in the neighborhood come in, and they start giving me a hard way to go. They're breaking my stones. I'm, I'm sorry. They give me a hard way to go. And uh, so, uh, and one thing led to another, and I just had enough. And I just stood up, and I just punched this guy in the face with the rock glass. Man, and I cut him severely. He bled like a pig. And the cops came and they handled, the guys who handled the job, they knew me, they cut me a break and they let me go. And that's where I learned my lessons about people, places, and things, you know. Uh, there were any number of reasons I was there, but the truth is that this is why I was really there. You know, I, like I said, I was arrogant and, and I had a lot of success in my job and I got a lot of publicity and just in case you missed the article, I would just happen to have an extra one on me and I would show it to you. But towards my uh, end of my drink and I got in a lot of trouble, and, which also generated a lot of publicity, which I was embarrassed about. So I was back in this bar to let you know, don't believe the hype. Don't believe everything you read. I'm back. I'm good. It's strong. You know, things are going good for me. I was nuts. And I have since found a place that sells roast beef without being in that type of environment. You know, it's just, it, was, it was a lesson learned. I was sober a, uh, just under a year, and all the men on the group were going on a retreat. And they came up to me, and they tricked me. And you know how you can trick new guys, you know. They came up to me and they said, Bobby, are you working this weekend? And what I should have said was why. But it, it just came out too quick. I said, no, I'm not. They said, good, we're going on a retreat. We're taking you. And, I, and you know what? I, need, I tell you, I wanted to hang out with these guys. But you know what? I didn't like these guys because they never asked me to hang out with them. But I always wanted to hang out with them. And, you know, and, and, but I liked them. I wanted to hang out with them, but I didn't like them. I would never sit next to them in the meetings. And I, I was just nuts. So they, they said, okay, we're going to go on this uh, retreat. So I said, okay. So I went on this retreat with them. And uh, they sent me, it was funny, they sent me in the back of the car, like in my line of work, how we used to sit, like prisoners, you know. I, I was in the back in the middle, and so I couldn't escape. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the closer I got to the retreat house, the bigger the knot that I got in my stomach. But I couldn't tell these guys why I hated God. How can I tell them about my mom? You know, the, the Christ, I, you just, I just couldn't tell these people. You know, I, I was afraid what they would think. And, but the need for me to be liked by these guys outweighed anything else. So here I am again, putting myself in a position that I'm comfortable with, but because I want to be liked by these guys outweighed anything else. That's just nuts. I'm in the retreat house. I'm there about 10, 15 minutes before I run into the retreat master. As soon as he saw me, his eyes lit up and he smiled. He's my disciplinarian from high school. <laughs> and not only that, but he was a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he smiled, he came up to me, he said, man, I knew that was your problem, we start talking. And he wanted to know how long I'm sober and everything else, I'm telling him what's going on, you know, home group, all this other stuff. He said, listen, you got yourself a sponsor? I says, no, I don't, because I'm a pretty bright guy. I, I don't tell him that because he knows I'm bright, but I'm a pretty bright guy and I don't need a sponsor. And uh, he told me, he said, well, I strongly suggest you get a sponsor. I said, okay. So that retreat, that my roommate at that retreat that weekend, I guessed him to be my sponsor. Just in case if I, in the future, should I ever be questioned again, hey, listen, you got a sponsor? <laughs> so yeah, there he goes right there. <laughs> because it, you, you got to be careful when you know they trick you up with them questions. So I said, yeah. So, so I, I would see this guy at meetings, and he would wave to me and say, Bobby, I still got that same phone number. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give you a call. I never called him. Know what I used to do? I used to tell my friends, oh, you won't believe this guy. He got me doing this, he's saying this, he's doing that. I made it all up, he didn't do nothing. He put the hand of help out there, the hand of AA, and I'm the one who slapped it away. I character assassinate this guy. Man, I was nuts. I was uh, sober 23 months. I beat another man with a baseball bat. I forget what step I was working that day, but I was just nuts. I was crazy. I was I swear to God, my early recovery, my first couple years, I used to go to a lot of go-go bars, right? I drank soda. I'd get my picture taken, right? And I would go to the meetings and pass the picture around to the old guys because I figured they would like me. 
they would look at the picture and they would look at me and they would shake their head and say, please kid, please keep coming back. <laughs> and again, I thought they was being facetious. I said, okay, I'll keep coming back. I was nuts. I was sober two years, second anniversary. I didn't celebrate it. I was crazy as a bed bug. My home group, we have a cork board, first name, last initial, date, a month, how many years you're sober. Celebrate anniversaries monthly. True story, I'm not proud of it, but this is a deal. Bobby C, two years, Joey A, three years, and Joey went out, I took pride in that, I moved up. I was nuts, I thought I was like a seniority, I was caught, caught up with time, you know? <laughs> I, you know, I swear to God, I had no idea who John Barleycorn was. <laughs> I was wondering why everybody was blowing this guy's anonymity. I said, you know, I was saying, you know what, he's really a tough SOB. I wouldn't want to tangle with this guy. When I found out who John Bartercorn was, I felt so stupid. But here I was, I was so damn bright, it damn near killed me. Ah, oh, it's nuts. 25 months sober, I went to eat my gun. The same pathetic feeling I had 25 months before, but 25 months before, I'm loaded with drugs and alcohol. Here I am, stone cold sober, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was dying from untreated alcoholism. I was a liar, thief, and a cheat. I 13-step people. I did everything wrong you could do in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing I didn't do was pick, I did not pick up a drink one day at a time. And I would go to meetings and I would share these crazy stories and people would pat me on the back and say, that's okay, Bobby, just don't drink. And I took that as saying, well, I could do whatever I want and just not drink. And I now know that's not the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. People say, just don't drink and go to a meeting. Again, I'm a bright guy. I, why can't I cut that middle thing out and just not drink, you know? Stay home and watch, you know, the Eagles or something and just not drink. But I was nuts, you know? And I now know that's a contradiction to the first step. People say, just don't drink no matter what. Well, you know what? I drink no matter what. You know, I drink when I got a girlfriend and when she dumps me because I'm an animal, I drink because I feel sorry for myself. I drink when I got a pocket full of money, when I'm suspended and I'm broke, I drink because I steal your money. You know, 4th of July, Labor Day, October 3rd, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it didn't matter, I drank. You know, I, I, I would stop drinking for lots of reasons. I would get jammed up in my job, abusing my sick time, and my boss would be telling me about that. I would go on the wagon for a bit and I would drink. I'd be living with this girl at the time, and she said, Bobby, you're a good guy, but when you drink, you're nuts. You gotta stop. I go in the wagon for a bit and I drink. I try to give it up for Lent, I give it up for this, give it up for that, you know, never. I can never stay stopped drinking, you know. I forget what's the longest period I had, but I know it couldn't be more than seven, eight, nine days, you know. I drank no matter what. Birds fly, fish swim, drunks drink, that's what I do, you know. And I was crazy as a bed bug in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, dying from untreated alcoholism. I hated everybody, but who I hated the most were the guys coming behind me. How dare they get better before me? Because you know what, I could fake the talk, you know, but uh, you couldn't fake the glow. And these guys that had this glow about them, I hated them because they were getting it before me. Uh, you know, going back when I had my one year anniversary, I told my story and it was amazing. I got done, thunderous applause, the blind could see, the lame walked, it was an incredible experience. <laughs> And people came up and they patted me in the back and said, way to go. It's all good. I lied during my entire story. The fact that I identified myself as an alcoholic, I didn't believe that. Again, I thought it was of my short use of other substances. Maybe I got this mental illness stuff. Maybe I got this stress stuff they're talking about. It can't be booze. I was an alcoholic. I was a beer drinker. I can't be an alcoholic. In fact, during the course of my telling this story, a bottle of beer appeared in my head. But you guys don't want to hear that. You want to hear all the quotes from the literature. So 25 months, I want to eat my gun. Safe to assume my life was unmanageable. There was a guy from my neighborhood who was in and out of uh, prison in the late 60s, early 70s, like a revolving door. I saw him in a meeting one day. His nickname was Troubles. Hard-earned nickname, but no one called him troubles to his face because like, he was a rough dude. So I seen him at a meeting one time. I came up to him and said, Bobby, I said, I need some help. I said, would you be my sponsor? He said, Bobby, I've been watching you for these past couple years, and I'm sticking my chest out. Like, yeah, he likes me. He said, I need to tell you. He said, you're full of shit. <laughs> That's not the response I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. He said, I'm going to be your sponsor under certain conditions. Hey, you're going to call me every single day. You're going to go to a big book meeting a week. You're going to go to a step meeting a week. You're going to go to a men's meeting a week. You're going to get yourself a coffee commitment, and you're going to leave them damn women alone. And I'm looking at him, and I'm saying to myself, like, who's he talking to? 
I'm sober 25 months. I'm selling the grapevines. Like, what I got it going here, you know? <laughs> but what I did do, I looked him dead in the eye. I said, okay, that's what, I'm willing to do that. And I believe that's the night that I took the first three steps, you know? Like I said, I knew that I was powerless over alcohol, you know? But I went to eat my gun. Like I said, my life was certainly unmanageable. If that's the problem, the solution had to be power greater than myself. And regardless of the resentment I had towards God, I knew it was working because, again, these guys coming in after me, these poor sick souls, I saw them getting better before me, I, in front of my eyes. I, I saw this happening. So I knew that there was a higher power. I just needed to get over whatever resentment I had. And my sponsor told me there was a difference between making a decision and making a commitment. And we went back to his house that night, and we got on our knees together, and we said that third step prayer. And when I got that done, he said, Bob, and that's what he said. He said, Bobby, there's a difference between a commitment and a decision. Or, you know, and you're making a commitment to go to any length to get sober. He introduced me to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, this is where the program's at, and I start doing my inventory. Now, I didn't want to do one of these. I'm going to meetings, and people say, whoa, easy does it. Don't want to get well too soon. <laughs> And all these other slogans, you know. And I know these slogans serve a purpose, but you can kill people, you know. And, uh, oh, you know, I, I'm doing my fourth step. Oh, easy does it. You know, <laughs> you know, just for today. And all this other stuff. And I'm nuts. And I'm thinking, you know what? I want to end my life not doing my inventory. I better do my inventory. I mean, it can't be any worse than I'm doing right now. And I did my inventory. And you know what? It wasn't that tough. Everything I wrote down, I did. No secrets jumped out at me. What was tough was the next one. <laughs> that was the tough part, talking to my sponsor. And then, so I called him up. I said, Bobby, I said, I'm going on a retreat this weekend to do my fifth step with a priest. He said, Bobby, that's great. When you get done, come by my house. <laughs> and you know how, again, sponsors could be on the phone and like they're telepathic. Like I'm saying to myself, look, what are you, deaf? Do you hear me? He must have picked up on it. He said, I, I heard you. Did you hear me? He said, when you get done, you come by my house and do it with me. And before I could respond, he said, Bobby, the reason I'm telling you this, if I'm your sponsor, I'm supposed to walk you through this journey, if I'm supposed to help you with your character defects, I think I ought to know what they are. Even though I'm sure at this point he knew what they were anyway, but he needed to know. The reason I wanted to go with the priest it was not to be spiritually enlightened. Just because I wrote God in the church down on the resentment sheet, I still had the resentment. It was still there. I just wrote it down. The truth was there were a lot of things I was embarrassed about. And I didn't want to go with my sponsor because I thought he would ridicule me. I thought he would pass judgment on me. Or even worse, he would break the confidence and tell the people what I did. That's the sole reason. And I knew between the priest and I, that wasn't going to happen. I never did that fifth step with that priest. I did it with my sponsor. And you know what? Those fears I had turned out to be unfounded fears. He didn't ridicule me. He didn't pass judgment on me. And to the best of my knowledge, he didn't tell anybody else. You know? And what he did do, he shared some of his stuff with me which took away the terminal uniqueness that I thought that I was the only guy to do certain things or have certain thoughts or whatnot. And I'll be forever indebted for him for doing that, you know? You know, he didn't leave, let me leave right away. He had a quiet room set up in his house. He said, Bob, you want to go upstairs, you know, and sit quietly for that hour. I guess he didn't trust me, you know, because I was still, like, my head was still racing a little bit. But I did. I sat quietly for the hour. And I can only share about my experience. And my experience was the screaming inside stopped, you know? That may not sound like a lot to you, but you know, to me, it was an incredible experience. Here I was at this point, 30, 31 months without a drink or a drug. And I didn't have the urge to drink, but most of all, I didn't have the urge in my life. See, towards the end of my drinking, I could no longer shave, you know? I get a couple strokes with the razor, and I had visualized this, you know? Uh, I would look at the, uh, the mirror, and I actually saw like an evil spirit making me take a razor and cut my throat. I couldn't even shave towards the end of my drinking, you know? Always had this, you know? And even on my job, I was doing some really crazy things, put myself because I didn't have the courage in my life, so I figured someone else would do it for me, you know? And there were a lot of rewards in the program, but that's one of the most best one I had. It's been quite a number of years since I thought about taking my life. I didn't burn my fourth step when I did my fifth with my sponsor because I needed it for the rest of the steps. Six and seven, the character defects. Before I did my inventory, I didn't know what these character defects were. I knew that I was a character when I drank. When I did my inventory, I found out I had no character whatsoever. I was irresponsible, I was not trustworthy, I was, uh, you know, selfish, self-centered, you know, I, I had nothing. I wasn't dependable, you, you know, you couldn't rely on me for anything. I cared about me and nobody else, and if you got in my way, you know, shame on you, you know. 
And the sixth step, I, I was, you know, I was ready. You know, I, I was willing to have God. And if I didn't have the willingness, I could pray for the willingness because I had experienced this in the third step. And the seventh step was a prayer. You know, God remove these character defects from me. Then my sponsor pointed out to me, he said, Bobby, it's much more than a prayer. You need to put legs on those prayers. You know, and sometimes you hear an AA, you know, some, I, I hear a lot of cop that, oh, I turned it over, you know, must be God's will. You know, it's a program of action. God will do for me what I can't do for myself, but you know what, it is a program of action. And I could pray all day long, God, help me be patient, help me be patient. But should I leave this meeting and, you know, where when I go home Sunday, I'm driving up 95 and someone cuts me out. I chase them for five miles and I give them the finger. That prayer for patience goes out the window, you know. <laughs> so I need to do, it's a program of action, you know. I need to put legs on those prayers. My A step, most of my A step was done because I didn't burn my fourth step. But I had to put more names down. You know, and I was one of these guys, oh, I didn't harm anybody but myself. That should have been a tip off. I never did my inventory. I harmed everybody. And unfortunately, most of all, I harm those closest to me the most, you know? The nice step direct amends. No phone calls, no letters, because I didn't hit you with a bat over the phone or through the mail, you know? And when I want to take those steps, I can make up of any number of reasons. Oh, he no longer lives in the neighborhood. That's why I won't do that. The truth is, when I want to pick up the phone or send you a letter, I'm afraid to face you. And if I got those fears, then I need to go back and address those fears. You know, because my sponsor said, Bobby, direct amends, not indirect. And I'd like to share two experiences on the ninth step. I met this meeting one uh, a number of years ago, and I have not seen this guy since 1977. This guy was not on my fear list, not, not for any reason, you know, other than I forgot, you know. I'm sitting at this table, this guy walks down the steps. I recognize him immediately. He does not recognize me. What I used to do, I was in a bar one time in altercation and he kind of backed down. So from that point on, when I want to impress anybody how tough or crazy I was, I would publicly humiliate this man. And I'm not a tough guy, I never was. Uh, but I, I, you know, I was a bully. And uh, so I, I would verbally abuse this guy who wouldn't do nothing. And I, I would, you know, I, I slapped him. And one day I spit on him. I mean, what worse thing can you do to a human being, you know? Just utter disregard. So. Uh, I recognized him right away. So I got introduced, I was speaking, and I looked this guy dead in the eye. I said, my name is Bobby, I'm an alcoholic. Now I need to tell you why I use my full name. I know these traditions, you need to have clearance to understand these traditions, you know, it's top secret stuff. They're, they're misunderstood, but most of all, this 11th tradition, you know. This 11th tradition is real clear. At the level of press, radio, and film, you will never see me on television or in the newspaper or hear me on the radio giving my full name and saying that I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is a break of the 11th tradition when you do that. Dr. Bob was real clear. He said when one drunk is anonymous from another drunk, that is a violation of the 11th tradition. He went on to say that anonymity was spiritually inspired and secrecy is feared inspired. I mean, it's like when we come into AA, it's like we join the mafia. We got all these nicknames. There's Bucktooth Mary and Frank the Fox and Pepsi George and Red Sweater Jerry. I mean, what is this? I don't want no one to know that I'm sober. Everybody in my neighborhood knew I was a drunk. It was those little telltale signs. They come out and they catch me. I'd be urinating on their car. My girlfriend threw the clothes out the window. I'm slumped behind the wheel of my car. Everybody knows I'm a drunk. Now I get sober. I don't want no one to know that I'm an AA. It's nuts. Nuts. However, I have no right to break anybody else's anonymity. If you choose not to use your full name, that's cool. That's, you know, I respect that. But I'm involved in service in my area back home and we use our full names. Because the truth is, three o'clock in the morning, you feel like drinking, you're gonna call information? Yeah, I'd like to have Frank the Fox's phone number. You're out of luck. Or you wanna go visit one of these old timers in the hospital? Yeah, I'm here to see Bucktooth Mary. Good luck. You know, it's just nuts. So that's the 11th tradition. That's why I use my full name. I looked this guy dead in the eyes and my name is Bobby Coyle and I'm an alcoholic. He nodded then, he remembered me. I got done telling my story and then it came time to make amends. I was taught that making amends is much more than saying that I'm sorry. There are two words that don't mean squat. Here it is, I got to right the wrong. This is what the nice step's about. And for me, if I took money from you, it's really easy. I go in the pocket and I pay you or I go in the payment plan with you. But what about that emotional or psychological damage we do to people? What do we, how do we make amends for that? I figured the least I could do if I publicly embarrass this guy, I needed to make amends to him publicly. It wasn't a grandstand. And I told the group what I used to do. And his name was Bob also. And 
His name was Bob. It wasn't also. I'm not breaking his anonymity. His name also was Bob. So I would... I told the group what I used to do, and uh, you know what? He came up and he hugged me. He forgave me. Incredible experience, you know? When I got done, I started talking to him. I said, yo, Bob, like, like, now I need to tell you, I live in South Philadelphia. He was living in um, Roxborough, which is like the northwest part of the city. This meeting was in North Philadelphia. And you know, neither of us were from the neighborhood. So at the end of the meeting, I started talking to him. I said, Bob, what's going on? He said, well, Bobby, I need to let you know. I'm sober three years now. I'm doing this and doing that. I said, that's great. And then the arrogance kicks in me, because everyone knows me, right, <laughs> in Philly. I said, well, i never seen you before. Eh? And he told me where he was living. He said, Bobby, I was flipping through the meeting directory tonight, and I just wanted a different meeting. And when I flipped through the directory, for some reason, this meeting jumped out at me. I believe that God put that guy in my path that night because we have 1,600 meetings a week in Philadelphia. We've got a pretty thick meeting directory. I was in a neighborhood that I usually don't go to. He was in a meeting that he never went to. We were sober of a number of years. The ninth step says, wherever possible. You know, not whenever, and I used to thought that said whenever. And whenever denotes time, wherever's place. And you know, for us, it's never the right time because we're too busy, easy, doesn't it? Or keeping it simple, you know? <laughs> and I had, I had two options when this guy came up to me. I could make amends, or I could do what I used to do all the time. You know, people come up and confront me, hey, yeah, you ass obey, and I go, whoa, 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 you got me confused, you're talking about my brother Brian. See, when you got eight people, like in a nine-year span, there's a, cl a close resemblance, and I did this numerous times. People would call me on my stuff, oh, no, you're talking about my brother, or my younger brother, or something, you know, not me. I made amends to this guy, this guy hugged me, and he forgave me, and it was a credible experience. On the flip side of this, my home group for a while was the Stepping Stones group in Philadelphia. I made a motion at the business meeting. It was definitely for the betterment of AA because I'm the one who made it. And uh, uh, there's discussion, but the motion doesn't get seconded. And I can't believe it. And the guy leading the opposition to the, my motion is my boy, Freddie. Now I need to tell you, there's a lot of rules in the neighborhood, and I know that some of them are backwards, but you, you just you adhere to the rules. And one of the rules is right, wrong, or different, you back your boy. You can never date his ex, you know, and all that other stuff, but you always back your boy, no matter what. It's just, it's just a neighborhood rule. Everyone knows it. I could not believe that he didn't back me up. I, come, I, I was floored. So the motion doesn't even get second. I would come to meetings. I would see four men at the table. Freddie be one of them. I would say hi to three of them. I would never say hi to Freddie again. I'm at work one day, and my coworker came up to me. He said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels is outside. He wants to take care of some sort of business. I peeked through the window. I seen him. I said, tell him to take his fat ass down to City Hall. He can't do that here. A few weeks later, that same coworker called me up. He said, Bobby, he said, Freddie Wheels died last night. And he said, the reason I'm telling you is because he always spoke so highly of you. Now, here he was, a friend of mine, a very good friend. And because he didn't happen to agree on whatever that motion was, and as God is my judge, I can't tell you what it was. That's how petty it was. And I had many opportunities to make amends to him, and I chose not to. And then when my coworker told me, he said, Bobby, he always spoke so highly of you. I felt about you big, you know, and I've been, been praying for Freddie ever since. So that's two ex my two experiences, uh, at least two of them, on the ninth step, wherever possible. One where I took advantage of the situation, I reaped the rewards. One where I chose not to, I paid the price, you know. The 10 step for me is nothing but four through nine on a regular basis. Now, if I'm gonna stand up here and tell you I do a 10 step every day, that, yeah, that's not true. But I'm pretty consistent though, I really am. But you know, sometimes I try to stay sober on yesterday sobriety and I kick back and every time I say, you know what, that doesn't affect nobody but me. That's not true, it affects everyone because if I'm not practicing these principles, I become a nitwit and should you encounter me during the course of the day when I'm in nitwit mode, you're affected also. I mean, I just got this way about it. You know that old saying, you can't miss what you never had? I never had a peace of mind, so I never missed it. That's why in the early days, I would go to meetings, and meetings would be real calm and serene. I tell you, serene people scared the hell out of me. So I would get my hand up to get it all crazy, to get it goofy, because then I'd be comfortable with that, because I loved craziness. And I would, go, like I said, I would go to the men's room, or I'd go get a cup of tea to come back and sit next to me, and the person would be sitting on the other side of the room. He couldn't get further enough away from me. No one asked me to be their sponsor in early recovery. No one wanted what I had. I didn't carry the message. I carried the disease. I was nuts. But because of the 10th step, now when I'm on the beam, when I get knocked off the beam, I now know what I need to do to get back on the beam. And that's what the 10th step is for me, you know? And you know what? I no longer live 
I don't like that insanity anymore. In fact, I'm uncomfortable with it. I take myself out of situations. I don't like to live like that anymore. You know, so much better. The 11 step through prayer and meditation, I pray and meditate on a daily basis. I may do it a little different than the way I was raised, but that's okay. I'm comfortable with the way I, I, I do it. And I improve my conscious contact. I got a conscious contact with the higher power as I went through these steps, you know. And I pray for the knowledge and the will for us, for me, to carry his will out, you know. And I really believe one of the things I'm supposed to do is help other alcoholics, you know. And I believe that's why I'm here. The 12 step says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I did the steps and that's the result. I've had a spiritual awakening. I haven't seen any burning bushes. I haven't heard voices from above or any lightning bolts or anything like that, and that's good. In fact, it's been a number of years since I heard any voices at all, and I'm forever grateful for that. <laughs> we tried to carry this message. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been to thousands of meetings since I've been sober, and I hear some crazy messages, and I gotta look up at the slogan to make sure I'm in an AA meeting. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the most important part of the step is to practice these principles in all my affairs. I'm only in a meeting an hour, hour and a half a day. But what about the other 22 and a half hours? What about the time on my job? What about the time in my neighborhood? The time with my family or, you know, interacting with other people? That for me, that's where it's tough to practice these principles. For me, it's real easy in the rooms of AA. But you know what? In, out in the real world, that's where it's tough, especially in my neighborhood. I live in a funny neighborhood. It's, uh, Strange things happen. It's like the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, like things fall off the back of trucks a lot. Everyone got a deal and an angle, and you know, and, and I can't live like that, you know, uh, because if I can start justifying cutting the corners here and, and doing this and that, then I can justify other behaviors, and before I know it, I can justify a drink. You know, I made a lot of mistakes since I've been sober, and making mistakes won't get me drunk. However, just to find those mistakes or those mistakes or not learning from those mistakes, that's the arrogance that gets me drunk. I'm not the poster boy of Alcoholics Anonymous. I invite you, come live with me for a week, you know? See what type of guy that I am. But you know what, I know I'm not the same guy that I was 14 years ago. I know I'm no longer intentionally harming people. I'm not whacking guys with bats. You know, I'm not trying to hook up with other people's uh, spouses. Uh, you know, I'm not using other people's credit cards. I'm not doing all that other stuff, stuff that I did sober, you know? I'm not proud of my past. And, and if I could change it, I would change it in a heartbeat, but I can't. But you know what I need through the steps? Like I said, not only has the obsession to drink and the obsession and my life has left me, uh, but you know what? It has changed my attitude about my past. I now use my past to help other people. I then got involved in service and I learned about the traditions and I, I love the traditions. The traditions are to the groups what the steps are to the individuals. The steps are how it works and the traditions are why it works. And I got involved in service and I got to go all different places, you know? Philadelphia is a very segregated city, and I'm just not talking racially, even among the ethnics, you know. Uh, we used to say in Philly, uh, we, we don't know what neighborhood you're from, we said, what parish are you from? And once you tell me, I can tell what your ethnic background is, and your socioeconomic status, and all that other stuff. And you didn't wander out of your neighborhood, because you did, you know, you got beat up, or things like that. But I saw going to other parts of Philadelphia, just to see how AA was. And you know what, I think it's pretty cool. I remember the first time I left my meeting, uh, my area, and I went to another neighborhood, I seen the way they did us. Ah, oh, they're doing it wrong. I found out they're not doing it wrong, they're doing it differently. The message is the same, it's just the delivery's a little bit more different. And I think that's pretty cool. I like that, you know? Uh, I got involved in the area. I, I want to be the youngest delegate ever to the area, for my area. I don't know who the youngest delegate was, I don't know how old he was, but it certainly was gonna be me. Ego is nuts, 1994 got diagnosed with cancer. It was a real fluke way the way I found out. So I went to go get a second opinion and it got confirmed. I came home and uh, it was lung cancer. I never smoked in my life. A little reefer for a short period of time, but I never, I was never a smoker. And I don't want you to think I handled it well because I didn't, you know. Again, I'm on the pity pot, you know. Like I'm doing the right thing, I'm sober for a while, things are happening and uh, I, I got really sick. And then I, you know, I had chemo and radiation and, you know, and then I went in remission and I got like really sick. And, uh, you know, I, I wound up having surgery. They had to remove the lower left lobe of my lung and things weren't looking good there for a while. And the nice thing about getting news like that, man, boy, does it help clear up that ninth step. <laughs> you know, I was one of those guys, I could never make uh, finish up my, my ninth step, you know. And uh, the truth was I was setting up some sort of justification for not doing any work, you know. And uh, I had to give them my position because I, I didn't have the strength uh, to do my job anymore. And I knew that the area would be better served with other people in the position. I just couldn't do it. 
And when I get out of the hospital, you know, I laid up in my house for a while. And people start coming to my house to carry that message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm just not talking about friends of mine. I'm talking people that I met like at the area assembly from other places that I really didn't know that well. I would recognize their face. And they came to my house to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. You're looking at a liar, thief, and a cheat. I stole from everyone. The only thing I gave was heartache and misery. And people came to my house to carry the message, you know. And I'm a firm believer in my doctors did a pretty good job, but without question it was the prayers of Alcoholics Anonymous that helped me a lot, you know. I was in Mexico about 10 years ago. I thought I could speak Spanish. I was the only English-speaking person in that room. I started speaking Spanish because I worked in the barrio. I worked up in North Philly all those years. My Spanish consisted of like, dame pistola, like give me your gun. <laughs> you know? so, so I'm at this meeting and I'm speaking Spanish. And into a couple of minutes I could see but by the puzzled look on their faces, they didn't know what the hell I was saying. So I switched over to English. And you know what, they still didn't know what the hell I was saying. <laughs> and you know what, at the end of the meeting, I could tell who the old timer was by the surrender in their face. And I could tell who the new guy was by the pain in their face. Know? And they came up and they hugged me. And even though they didn't understand, you know what? They understood. Language of the heart. It was an incredible experience. You know, I alluded earlier t that, uh, that I was a mummer. I am a mummer. I'm a third generation mummer. And usually when I go out of town, a lot of people don't understand. But I know some of you are from the Philadelphia area. You have an idea. Some of you don't. Uh, mummers is a, we do a New Year's parade in Philadelphia. It was, it's been going on for a couple hundred years, but it got so nuts with the gun shooting and the drinking that in, in 1901, the city organized it. So now we have organized insanity on New Year's Day. <laughs> I'm a third generation mummer, and uh, the mummer, for those who don't know, uh, first of all, it, it's a little class. It's from antiquity. It's taken from the Greek god of ridicule, who was mummus. That's where the word mummer derives from. So, uh, and that's the only class we got, because what it is, it's a bunch of drunken morons in sequins and feathers and makeup, and we spoof everything, we're not politically correct, we just act like nitwits. It's the longest continuous parade in the country, it goes about 12 hours, there's 30,000 of us, it's just nuts. I tell people, we make the Mormons, uh, we, we make the Mardi Gras look like a Mormon convention, it's just insanity. So I'm in a meeting 12 years ago, and I'm telling my story, and I said, I'm a lifelong mummer. A kid came up to me afterwards and said, listen, would you be interested in watching the parade this year? I said, man, you're out of your mind. People placing things. I got no business being there. He said, you don't understand. He said, we got a group together called the 12 Steppers, Sober Mummers. Now, that's an oxymoron, Sober Mummers. <laughs> but what I did, this will be the 12th year our brigade, the 12 Steppers, have gone up the street. And last year, I had the honor of being the captain of the brigade. And... Uh, it's very important. In 1979, my grandfather had dropped dead playing string band for the South Philadelphia String Band, and they slid him over, the band went on. I mean, that's just the way it was. You know? It wasn't that tasteless, but the band went on. I mean, it goes, goes. And, and so here I was able to participate in something that was a big part of me, my family, that I could do sober. And when we get to City Hall, we do a head count to make sure that no one gets pulled into the crowd, you know? But three years ago, in 1999, our brigade came in first place, you know? Nowhere did I ever sniff first, but didn't even come close. And not that there's much, just bragging rights. But, you know, it's just an incredible experience. This past year, you know, uh, January 1st, 2002, I marched in my 34th Mummers Parade, you know. And the reason I say that, if you are new, one of my favorite sayings in the big book, it says on page 132, and I hate quoting, but the promise is the only one, it says, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. If the newcomer could say no joy in our existence, they won't want nothing to do with us. Now, obviously, I just paraphrased that last sentence. Bill was a hell of a lot more eloquent than I was. But you get the point. You can have fun in recovery. If you think you need to wear the hair shirt and beat yourself, man, you're greatly mistaken. Whatever you did drunk, you could do stone cold sober. And be better at it, have more fun, and most of all, you can remember it, you know? I used to come home January 4th or 5th, my suit being tatters and uh, I didn't remember nothing, you know. I just knew if you were in a suit on New Year's Day, you drank for free, you know. But it, it's great, you know. Uh, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I started off by saying that I always wanted to be a part of, you know. And I always lied. I, I compromised my values and principles and everything else because I wanted you to like me. And I was never true to myself. And uh, I, don't, I no longer need to do that, you know. My life is like, it's pretty good today. You know, I got a lot of things going on. Uh, you know, I'll be uh, 
Friday I'll be 42 years old, uh, haven't had a drink in 14 years. Uh, I'm no longer a police officer, so for those who have warrants, relax. <laughs> but please, address that stuff, take care of that stuff, but you know, relax. <laughs> I'm no longer a police officer. I still work for the city, I work in another capacity. Uh, not married, I have no kids. Uh, uh, last summer, I uh, ended a relationship, the longest one I ever had. I was engaged to be married and met her in the rooms. Uh, she chose another lifestyle and we're no longer together. And it, it was tough not seeing her kid, but you know what? The truth is, I can no longer compromise what I'm willing to do. Like, I got certain standards today, and, and I don't mean that in any arrogant way whatsoever. But Alcoholics Anonymous has given me the courage to be true to myself, you know? And I try to treat people with dignity and respect. And I believe I'm a man of dignity and respect today. And I've gotten that from the old timers, the men who taught me act like a, a gentleman. I have a sponsor who lives out of town. I get to see him. Uh, I talk to him on a weekly basis. He's here this weekend. I have a home group. I sponsor other men. These are all important things. It's a whole bowl of wax. It's just not drink and go to meetings. You know, my experience, those involved in Alcoholics Anonymous are doing a lot better than those around Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was my personal experience. I'll finish up with this. You know, like next week, we got an anniversary going on. A year ago tonight, September 4th, I was in New York City, and I had dinner with a couple friends of mine, and I spoke at a meeting. Now, I go up there fairly often. It's fairly close to me. It's like 90 minutes right up the turnpike, and I'm there, and I go up fairly often. And back in August, uh, they had called me up and they said, Bobby, would you like to come up? And I said, sure. I said, I'll come up. I said, what do you got open? They said, we got the first Tuesday and the second Tuesday. I said, you know what, I'll come up on the first Tuesday because I had just come back from San Francisco, I was on vacation, and I still had the following week off. I said, I'll come up the day after Labor Day, and they said, that's cool. So I went up, I had dinner with a couple guys, and then we went to a meeting. And then uh, had, had, uh, the following Tuesday, like the world changed, and uh, my, uh, my friend who I had dinner with uh, wound up getting killed on Tuesday the 11th. On the 13th, uh, I, I work on a special team in Philadelphia, and our team got activated. And most cities have these types of teams, but because of the sheer magnitude of the situation up there, they needed some assistance. So uh, I, I got sent up there on the 13th. And I spent uh, f four days up there. And uh, I went up with the original duty, uh, but we just couldn't do it at the time because they were still in a rescue mode. So for four days, I, they had me in the armory, and I was registering people who were reporting their loved ones missing. And they were coming like with hairbrushes and toothbrushes and all types of stuff that may have contained DNA so we can catalog and try to help them. And it was just a, a just incredible experience. Uh, on the 15th, that Saturday, I went to uh, my friend Mike's funeral. And I, I couldn't get in, you know, all the dignitaries were here and all of his friends were stuck outside. And I'm standing outside the, the church and his church, his uh, rectory was right across the street from the fire station where he was detailed to. And I was standing outside and they had the mass on the speakers. And I ran into about eight or nine people from the program who came up to me and said, Bobby, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm up here working. And we started talking. And the reason I say that is uh, because Alcoholics Anonymous went on. There was a group that met at the Towers. In fact, they were called the Towers Group, obviously. That and many other groups were displaced. And uh, after a short period of time, we had established a group at Ground Zero called the Ground Zero Group. And uh, in fact, there's a story in this month's grapevine. And by the way, the grapevine's a wonderful tool. If it, if it, please get one. It's a great 12-step tool. You get done reading it and leave it on a bus or your doctor's office. It's, it's a wonderful little magazine. And in, in this month's issue, there's a wonderful story about a rescue worker there and talking to another volunteer. And it turned out that they're both in the program. I say this because whatever you think you got going on, you can get through without picking up a drink. I, I get uncomfortable when people say AA doesn't promise you anything. AA promises you many, many things, and they're the intangibles you can't put a price on. It's not the material things, but you know what? If you stay sober and you become responsible and you become a productive member of society, those material things will come along, but they're not the promises. The promises are like the self-respect, the peace of mind, you know, and totally how to handle situations that you to baffle us, you know, and. Uh, Whenever I see things on television, when I see calamity happen, the first thing I think is, what happens to Alcoholics Anonymous in our community? What goes on, you know? A couple of years ago, I was in Iowa, and shortly after I left, they had terrible flooding. You know, the same thing in Grand Forks. I was in Grand Forks, North Dakota, a couple of years ago, and uh, the, the town was literally underwater, the worst flood they had in over 100 years. And I got there after the flood, and I talked to a friend of mine, the guy who hosted me, the former delegate. I said, how did you guys make out? 
He said, you know what? Everyone came together and we had one group. All the other groups were displaced, but we had one group and we got through. See, there's a lot of lies in AA, and one of those lies is the only thing you need to start a, a meeting is a coffee pot and a resentment. How about staying through at that group? And, I, and, I, and I've sat, I've been part of this. I've been at my group, and, and we've had a business meeting, and we made a decision, and I chose not to, I didn't agree with the decision, but I didn't run out and start a meeting, even though using that logic, I had every right to do so. But how about for the unity of the group, staying there, you know, and swallowing my ego, and saying, okay, I'll go along with the group conscience. Because unity is the most important thing. Because, you know, that first tradition, I love what it says in the 12 and 12. It says, these are spiritual principles that we must adhere to. If not, dependably, ensure and swift. We sicken and die. Now, I don't know about you, but that tells me something serious is going to happen, you know. So for the unity of the group, I, I'll go along with this. So this happened in New York, you know. And people called, the general service office was closed for a couple of days, and then it got back on its feet. And people called from throughout the country offering help and where meetings would go. And you know what, Alcoholics Anonymous went on. And we were able to, you know, to get through that terrible situation. And a week from today, the 11th, I'll be up there for the anniversary. So if you're new, you can go through anything without picking up a drink. Get yourself a home group, get yourself a sponsor, be part of the solution, you know. That's all I got, thank you.